Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or I should say good afternoon in this case, and welcome again to ASAF Cafe. This is a show where um, I invite a guest every week, and then I just play music and we just talk. And our guest for this third segment of ASAF Cafe is Mrs. Sarah Tall-Whiteman of Missoula, Montana. She is my guest, and... Um, her husband, Clayton, if he shows up, uh, he'll be part of the guest on this show, too. But in the meantime, I'm going to start off with Sinatra's Night and Day. Sounds Thank you, thank you very much. I adore the music of Sinatra and all the other songs that probably go before your time, but they're still classics. Yeah, they're still good. That's what makes them classics. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are. Well, let's change the pace. Let's have fun with Secret Agent Man. I don't Sounds know if you know good. that song or I not. I do. Well, I'll give you my version of it. <laughs> classical version I made up of um, Secret Agent Man. I love it. So, those, all those fun, songs are fun. One of my yeah. teachers taught me how to take popular music and make them sound classical instead of playing it in the traditional way, which there's nothing wrong with that. Like, for example, okay. suppose you're in a nightclub and you're going to listen to the girl from Ipanema. You might hear something like this. to kind of make it sound a little 
more interesting. So I'll play that for you. Improvise, yeah. Yeah, this is called The Girl from Ipanema. See something like that. Thank you. Yeah, just a little classical version of the girl from Ipanema and all these other songs. And of course, when you play traditional classical music, it's classical music. So yeah. <laughs> you do it a little bit different than um, in popular music. But see, the thing about popular music is when you're learning the music and you're playing it, it's based on what's called chords and scales. Whereas with classical music, it's literally note for note and you have to memorize what fingers with each note when you're doing oh. a classical piece and then you do it the same way every time. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like to play classical music because it's, it's just very difficult to prepare and learn. Of course, with popular music, you get a little bit more liberties, a little bit more freedoms and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And so speaking of liberties and freedoms, I think I'll play Chariots of Fire. Sounds great. Let me adjust this piano a little bit here. <laughs> and one of the things, ladies and gentlemen, that just happened um, last Monday, which was September 29th, we shot the pilot of the brand new Lawrence Welk show. It's called Music with ASAF, a remake update of the Lawrence Welk show. And that was shot at the Governor's Ballroom at the Florence Hotel. And Mayor John Ingen was part of that program. And he was just such a good sport and a delight to have on the program. Now, this program is going to air um, October 29th at 9 p.m. on this MCAT station, uh, channels 189 and 190. And also, you can go to MCAT.org and click Watch Now and see it at the same time simultaneously. And um, we're hoping that uh, 
this show will go to NBC and ABC, and my attempt, what I'm going to attempt to do is see if I can make it into a weekly series on a national level. And uh, it was just such a delight doing this show. I had some really neat guests on the program, besides uh, Mayor Ingen, um my hostess, Louise Bundy. She was part of this program. She, in fact, she uh, is a professional ballet teacher and singer, and so she put on a little ballerina outfit and did a little routine while I was playing Nadia's theme from the television show The Young and the Restless, which I'll play for you in a moment. And then we had some other artists. Joe Sullivan from uh, Billings, Montana, drove all the way up to Missoula to be part of this show. Robin Elaine Dent and her friend Chris Foster were also part of the program. And Robin did an update of Dean Martin's Sway, which sounded really nice. And um, Chris did a little guitar solo, flamenco style, if I had to describe it. And our featured guest was a young woman named Maya Wynn, 17-year-old Maya Wynn from Missoula. And uh, she looked really cute. She had like uh, these wings on when uh, she was doing her updated songs and stuff like that. And so when I did Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, I had her stand on, the, on my left side of the piano and she... She raised herself up like the little fairy, and she just looked, she looked really adorable, um, and it worked with Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. So all these people will see this, this telecaster eventually, and um, I'm going to contact them so they'll know to look out for the pilot. It's being edited. And, that sounds exciting. Yeah, and also I want to acknowledge the Alps Corporation. They made this program possible, and... Um, uh, the Missoula Cultural Council was involved. Two Sisters Catering was involved. 111 Boutique, they furnished all the clothing for the women that appeared on the show. And uh, Tuxedo Gallery provided the tux that I had for the program, which I'll send you some copies of that in a little bit. And um, also the Missoula, the, the, the Missoula Partnership, they were involved in it too. And uh, the director there, she had a little bubble machine so we were shooting out <laughs> bubbles <laughs> yeah, just like Lawrence Welk oh, and uh, cool. <laughs> so what I decided to do is just in in keeping with the tradition and legacy of Lawrence Welk with this show we want to do modern music but um, in the Welk style the Welk fashion so it's such a great idea I can't wait to see it yeah it'll and I'll say it again ladies and gentlemen <laughs> it will air October 29th here locally and um, that's at 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. here at this MCAT, uh, channel 189, 190, or go to MCAT.org again and click Watch Now. And then it'll air again November 1st at 5 p.m. So we're all looking forward to this pilot premiere. And I worked on this project for three months yeah. to prepare for it, getting the guest and everything. So maybe I'll have a private screening uh, ahead of time if I get the opportunity. But in the meantime, here at ASAF Cafe, I will do Nadia's theme just for you. Sounds great. Yeah, Luis is not here right now, but uh, I can still play the song. <laughs> so here we go.
There you go. That's it. That is Nadia's theme. They used on the television show The Young and the Restless. Yeah, it reminds me of when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, do you know the history of that song? I don't. In 1976, a young Russian gymnast named Nadia Komenich was the first person to ever score a perfect 10 oh. in the Olympics. And because of that, that song came into existence. Oh, that's awesome. So it's called Nadia's Theme. And uh, then they eventually started using it on that television show, The Young and the Restless, which I admit I watch on occasion. <laughs> 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 Probably shouldn't be watching soap operas, but uh, yeah, don't you have work to do? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I used when I was younger, I used to watch a lot of those soap operas, like All My Children and yeah. Ryan's Hope, which I don't think anybody's going to remember because that ended mm -hmm. years ago. One Life to Live, and I remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> so they at when I was growing up, soap operas were like. They just dominated the daytime television, and um, there's like a handful, like what, after about 40 years, of still on the air, like uh, The Young and the Restless. I think The Bold and the Beautiful. That one's still on. <laughs> I think that one is still on, too, so. <laughs> it got to the point I had to kind of wean myself off some of these soap operas, because I, I, there was a time where I was watching them all and getting so engulfed in them. And it's not really real, it's just acting and yeah. so on, but... Sometimes it's a nice escape, though. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're kind of fun to watch, but got to remember, it's just television. It's not real. <laughs> there is no Erica Kane. No. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. But the actress that plays Erica Kane, Susan Lucci, she is a very beautiful woman. She, yeah. She's always been like that, blessed with looks. Yeah. So, some people are, but some uh, people are. <laughs> yeah, and I think she was just one of them. Uh, let's see, um, let's do a little love song here. Did you see the movie Somewhere in Time with um, the actor Christopher Reeves and Jane Seymour? Well, you may recognize the song. It, yeah, uh, yeah it, this is the theme song from that. The theme song to uh, Somewhere in Time. Did, um, if you ever get to see that movie, you should. Yeah. It's kind of a sad movie. Basically what it's about, um, there's an older woman in the future, and she goes to a young Christopher Reeves, and she says, come back to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what he does is he empties all his, his things from the future, like coins and, you know, things like that, and he goes back into the past. Oh, to wow. when she was a young woman <laughs> and they kind of rekindled their love and what was sad um, nobody dies necessarily but at the end of the movie after they've had this intense love affair and uh, relationship he pulls out a coin accidentally from the future that he had forgotten to take out of his pocket which plunged him back into the future oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like really depressed because he wasn't able to go back to the past and so if I remember that if I remember at the end of the movie he either dies or he 
he goes to heaven or something like that, and she's up there waiting for him. And... Aww. <laughs> well, at least they end up together. Kind yeah, of. they end up together at the end of the film again. But <laughs> it was sad, though, when he got plunged into the future again. You're like, oh, no, no, no. I'm melting. <laughs> so anyway, it's kind of an older film, so I don't mind talking about it because I think everybody's pretty much seen that movie by yeah. now at this point. <laughs> so, um, let's go back. Speaking of time travel, let's go back in time. I'm not going to tell you the name of the song, but tell me if you think you've heard it or not. It. Song? Somewhat familiar, but I can't. I can't play that it. is a song called "Tumbling Tumbleweeds." Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I okay, think it no, goes it's, back. It's so close. We're talking about time travel. I think it goes back to 1930s, around oh, the 1930s. Really? Yeah, a singer named Gene Autry made that song famous. I don't know if you remember him or not. No. <laughs> he uh, came up in a time when they had what was called the singing cowboys on television. They had people like himself, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers. I don't know if oh, you yeah. remember him. And uh, these, you know, they had the little Western thing. And they, they, both of these cowboys were fine singers. So it depended on whether you were a Roy Rogers fan or Gene Autry fan. But Gene Autry introduced that song to the world, Tumbling Tumbleweeds. And uh, over the years, there's been other artists that have done the song. Like, uh, I don't know if you remember the old Dean Martin show or not, but there was a clip where Dean Martin and Gordon McRae, who was another famous singer of the past, and Ella Fitzgerald, she was a famous jazz singer. They, her. Yeah, they did their version of Tumbling oh, Tumbleweeds. Fun to see. Yeah, I've got a clip of that at home on the old Dean Martin show. So they just, all three of them together, and they were doing a little vocaling and, you know, the harmony thing, and they did this whole tumbling tumbleweed so oh, that'd be so fun yeah. to see. I love Ella yeah well if you uh, if you find the old Dean Martin show just see if you can find that available it was yeah. Gordon McRae Ella Fitzgerald and uh, Dean Martin singing tumbling tumbleweeds but anyway that that goes way back into the past and another thing about Gene Autry I don't know if people know this the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that yeah. they play every year well, that was Gene Autry that was singing the vocal on that. Really? Yeah, you know that Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. I'm no <laughs> singer, but <laughs> anyway. Um, and the history of that song. Um, do you remember? Do you know um, Bing Crosby? Do you remember him? Yeah. Well, he was originally asked to sing that song. Really? Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, and he turned it down, so it was offered to Gene Autry, and of course, the rest is history. Is that why he ended up singing White Christmas later to make up for it? I don't know. I, I that I couldn't say. And um, you know, when you talk about time travel like this, somewhere in time, it'd be interesting to find out what it would have been like if Bing Crosby had did Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer instead of Gene Autry. Yeah. I guess we'll never know. But something about the way Gene Autry sang that song in his voice, it was perfect for that. It really was. And of course, I used to watch Gene Autry when I was growing up too. So, and I come from. Maybe not quite the 1930s, but uh, I grew up around the 70s, and they were showing all those reruns of Bing Crosby and uh, Gene Autry and all the rest of that era. And uh, let's see, we've be- we're, we're down to about a few more moments here on this first part of the program, and um, 
would be a good song from the past to do. Um, little love song. I'll give you my version of uh, Love Me Tender. Sounds good. Elvis <laughs> here. Me tender by Elvis, and I stand corrected. We do have a little bit more time, so I'll just keep talking to you and um, playing more songs. Sounds good. But songs from the past, um, to me, they were very delightful songs, delightful melodies, and that's just kind of the way it was. Are you fam familiar with the history of uh, music in our culture? Um, not specific. Well, here's not a quick specific. little flyover. They basically had what was called five periods in history, probably even before that. And you may have heard it as like the, uh, the um, medieval period and the um, Renaissance era or period, whatever word they used. And then the Baroque era, which was the beginning of the introduction of classical music. And I think people like um, Bach was alive at that time. And then they had what was called the classical period leading to the Romantic era. And that's kind of the start leading into the popular music that we have today. That's kind of just a generic flyover yeah. of music history. And um, in the 1940s, they had what was called big band music, which you're probably familiar with. There was people like Harry James and Glenn Miller and all the rest. Yeah. And it was kind of a rhythmic kind of uh, music where people could dance to. Uh, not, not break dance, obviously, yeah. or <laughs> hip hop at that time. And then early rock and roll started to evolve. Like, uh, I think they had artists like maybe Little Richard or um, Big Bopper and Buddy Holly and all those, all those uh, kind of performers started emerging on the scene. And it kind of pushed big band music aside. And I think one of the reasons was because that kind of music was very simple. It just had like a verse and then a little chorus, which they called the hook. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the young kids just ate it up. And, uh, you know, big band music was a little bit more complex, mm -hmm. even though you could dance to it. And 
they little, you know, you get your little teeny boppers, they call them, and it was just very fun and simple music, and it's kind of been like that ever since, in this sense of popular music. So that's kind of a generic flyover of the history of music there. And uh, have you ever heard of a song from Donovan called Mellow Yellow? Yes. I'm going to give you my version of Mellow Yellow. That's not exactly in the early rock and roll days, but I think it came up in the 60s or something, so I guess you can throw that in there. Yeah, so I'll give you my version of it. piano classical version of Mellow Yellow. And uh, in the 60s, you know, when we were talking about that generic presentation of the history, it was like early rock and roll and so on. And then in the 60s, it started evolving a little bit. You had people like um, Jim Morrison and the Doors. And, and uh, of course, they called it the British Invasion. Yeah. Um, they had like the Association, which you probably don't remember them. They did songs like Cherish and stuff like that. And of course, the uh, Beatles. <laughs> they, yeah, everybody knows the Beatles, so they kind of popped up into that British invasion. They all came from overseas. I think it was London or primarily, and they came to the U.S. and took the world by storm, <laughs> especially the Beatles. And speaking of the Beatles, let's have fun with them. I'm going to do um, Hey Jude. Hey Jude. Yeah, um, I think that's the name of it. short version of Hey Jude <laughs> by the Beatles and um, there were a lot of other interesting songs that the Beatles did um, I won't do the whole thing but I'll just do some excerpts to give you an idea like Eleanor Rigby I'm 
don't stop on that chord right there. Or the um, something song. And they did a lot of other delightful songs too that seem to have stand the test of time yeah, they have. and stuff like that. And uh, now we really are winding down for a few. We have a few more mo minutes left. And um, I won't do the whole thing, but let me give you an excerpt of a classical piece for our classical audience. I'm gonna do a, just a few verses of Claire de Lune. You may recognize it by W.C. stop right there on purpose mm -hmm. that song would take literally too long to play all the way through and you i'd probably have a much better chance of playing something like that on a regular piano studies little <laughs> keyboards but that 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 was the beginning of the claire de Lune. you know um there was a famous pianist when i was a little boy named uh, roger williams that i used to listen to i don't think people will remember him but for the ones who do i saw the actual manuscripts of his version of claire de Lune. And I freaked out, got scared at first, like, oh, no, I'm not going to touch that song. But as I got older, um, I realized how impressive a piece of work that was. And Roger Williams was, uh, he was considered a, what you call a popular pianist as far as pop music, but he was very skilled in playing the classics. He's got recordings of Flight of the Bumblebee and, uh, of course, Claire de Lune. And he, what he did was... It, traditionally, when you do Claire de, Claire de Luna, it starts out with, you know how I did it? But see, what he did was he uh, did the middle part first. He rearranged the order. He put the middle part and add some little cadenza things in there at the beginning of it before leading up to this beginning part. Nice. Yeah, it was impressive. I'll do it again. on that chord. That's a beautiful chord right there. But, um, yeah, I think Roger Williams' version of Claire de Lune is probably the best version of any person I've ever heard play that song, in my opinion, anyway, as a pianist. And, of course, the funny thing about it is somebody else may think some other pianist's version is the best. There really is no what you call best pianist. I think it's an interpretation. I think it's just whoever you like and stuff. Yeah. And of course, we can't we can't forget Mr. Showmanship himself, Liberace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a little boy, um, my brother and I we used to watch Liberace on television, and we used to make these Liberace jokes, you know, because he'd come out with the cape and <laughs> the rings and stuff. But you couldn't joke about his piano playing. Yeah. And um, I don't think he's going to be remembered as a concert pianist, but I think he was. I think he was a fantastic pianist, and I think he was great at it. And I think the reason people struggle with Liberace is because they can't get past the showmanship thing to pay attention to what the man was doing. Yeah. 
<laughs> so focus on the they, yeah, they, the, the ex eccentricities <laughs> they call it instead of watching what he was doing. And of course, there's clips of him probably on YouTube these days as a young man when you know before he did all the rhinestones and stuff, and he was playing songs like Claire de Lune and so on. So that's a little history of Liberace there. He he's, he was a brilliant pianist, and uh, I would highly recommend people watch him and of course Roger Williams. And you know, I got hooked on Roger Williams when I was a when I was a little boy. I saw him on the Ed Sullivan show. I don't know if you know who Ed Sullivan was. He was a famous uh, music leader that had guests come on his program. Yeah. And Roger Williams, they had this like orchestra in the background, and he was playing a song called "Black Eyed Peas" by Sergio Mendez. You probably don't know these people, but um, it was very impressive. That's how I got hooked on Roger Williams when I saw that, and I was like. I want to learn how to play the piano too. <laughs> and uh, since you were ten, yeah, um, I wrote about this in my autobiography. Um, I come from a military family, and uh, my father was stationed up there, um, Taipei, Taiwan. So my mom, my birth mom, my brother, and my sister, we all lived there at the time. And then we came back to the U.S. and he was stationed at Langley Air Force Base up there in Hampton, Virginia. And my father had a habit, like I wrote in my autobiography, he had this habit of drinking that gin and stuff. He'd get to drinking that stuff, and he'd leave the house and come home with something brand new like toasters or towels, uh, kitchen stuff. You know, just stuff. Yeah, just something. Yeah. And so this is a true story. One day he was drinking a lot of gin, and he left the house, and he came home with a brand new piano. Oh, awesome. When we lived up there in Virginia, and that's how this whole thing started. He came home with a brand new piano. I don't even think he remembered he bought it. And my mom had a fit. She's like, oh, what are we going to do with this piano? And uh, my mom was too poor to have it taken back. So it became part of the family. And I started messing around with it as a kid. And then when, when we moved to Sacramento, I began taking formal lessons. Oh, cool. And I started out by playing the trumpet. And, of course, I knew how to play the piano. And I eventually went on to become a pianist, and I've been at it ever since. But that's kind of the history of how the piano came into my family. <laughs> that's a good story. Yeah, through my father <laughs> drinking that gin. And I don't endorse drinking gin, y'all, so don't go drinking gin and buying a piano for your family. <laughs> you might be famous, though. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it happened with, with us. You know. It would have been nice to grow up like Ron Howard on the Andy Griffith show and get a piano the old-fashioned way and just come home, there's a piano waiting instead of having to drink some gin to yeah. get it. But You know, there's no saying the good Lord moves in mysterious ways. That's true. I would say that's probably a mild form of mysterious ways, you know. <laughs> Have a parent drink and gin and come home with a piano and you grow up to become a pianist. So that's kind of my history of how I became a pianist, or should say started. And of course, when I was a kid, I practiced an awful lot too. And I think I drove my mom crazy. She'd be like, Boy, why'd you go outside and play baseball with all your other friends? Well, I want to practice. <laughs> and I did. I used to practice and practice. And um, I'll give you a demonstration of practice. I'm going to do part of um, Prelude and C by Johann Sebastian Bach. Some people do it slow like this, which is okay. Others may do something like this. See? So it just depends on how you want to do it. But, um, yeah, I practiced an awful lot. And, you know, I'm known for playing the piano, at least here in Missoula at the, uh, at the mall, Southgate Mall, every holiday season, and um, the Paddy Creek Market over on Higgins. Oh, I've played you? there for three years, and of course the Double Tree Hotel. I do a lot of weddings and things like that, and of course this new television show that I just did last Monday. And um, I've been playing the piano all over the place. <laughs> That's good. All over the place. You so, <laughs> yeah, it's it's my baby. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to conclude with this version of Asaph Cafe. And again, my guest Sarah Tall Whiteman, and. Um, Again, the pilot for the new Lawrence Welk Show, Music with ASAF, an update of the Lawrence Welk Show, um, airs 
October 29th here on the MCAT station. And if it does go national, I will let you know. So until our next show, ladies and gentlemen, I am Asaf Adonai with Sarah here, Maranatha. Good job. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah.